Well, 21,221, that is the number of people who worshiped last weekend at one of our Easter services, <laughs> celebrating our risen Savior. And man, if that's not enough to celebrate, we've already had some incredible stories come rolling in. I think our college ministry this week sent me no less than 30 ways that they saw God move. Um, one of them they shared with me, they had at their uh, Easter service on Chapel Hill's campus, they had a girl that one of our student leaders in college had been reading the Bible with for over a year. And lo and behold, actually two days before Easter service, that girl ended up giving her life to Christ. Well, she utilized those 48 hours and ended up inviting two of her non believers friends to the Easter service at Chapel Hill. And then both those girls indicated after the service that they were interested in starting a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so this girl became a disciple and within 48 hours was a disciple making disciples. Um, pastor Rodell at our summit in Espanol campus pastor sent me a text and said, he said they had had a couple in their campus that quite frankly had been having a pretty rough go at it in their marriage the last few years. And he said, in the middle of the Easter service that that couple reconciled, believing that if God could raise Jesus from the dead, that he could do the same thing in their marriage, amen? And so one more time, let's give God some praise for everything he did last weekend that he will continue to do in the following weeks to come. If I'm being honest though, as awesome as Easter was, there were actually two things that really just didn't sit right with me uh, this Easter. One of them, uh, call me old fashioned, is the fact that Easter was on March 31st. I think it should be illegal to have Easter in anything other than the month of April. Um, but then the other thing that didn't sit right with me was that if March 31st was Sunday, that meant Monday, the day after Easter was April 1st and April 1st, the first day of the month is the day that all my bills are due. And so something about my bills being due the weekend after celebrating how Jesus paid it all, it just don't sit right with your boy. And so um, didn't like it very much, but it's neither here nor there. And so uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and pull them out, open them up uh, to John chapter seven is where we're gonna be, John chapter seven. Um, if, you've, uh, if you're new here with us, just for the last several weeks, let me kind of catch you up to speed. For the last several weeks here at the summit, We've been looking at the seven times in the Gospel of John that Jesus takes the loftiest name of God in the Old Testament, the name I Am or Jehovah, and he claims that name for himself. And what makes these I Am claims so significant to us is that each time that Jesus takes one of these names of God, he applies it to one of our most acute places of felt Need. And so if we were to rewind week one, Pastor JD showed us that to those who are hungry, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. To those who are in darkness, he says, I am the light. To those who are in need of shelter, he says, I am the door. And then last weekend, we saw how to those who have been feeling the sting of death, Jesus declares, I am the resurrection and the life. Well, this weekend, we're going to look at John chapter seven and have a, um, let's just call it kind of a bonus track where Jesus addresses another one of our personal felt needs, but applies to it, in this case, not necessarily a direct I am statement, but he applies to it an image of living water. And so John chapter seven, we're gonna begin in verse 37. Hopefully you've made your way there. If you have, would you stand with me? Can we stand at all of our locations in honor of the reading of God's word? John chapter, 30, or John chapter seven, beginning in verse 37. It says, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. For whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this, Jesus said about the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Father, this morning, so I open your word. Would you incline our hearts to your understanding? Would you open our eyes that we may see wonderful things out of your word? God, unite our hearts to fear your name and satisfy us this morning with your unfailing love. If you agree with that church, would you say amen? Amen. amen. Y'all can be seated. Um, humor me for a moment this morning. In your head, not out loud, I want you to try to add up, count the number of decisions you think you've already had to make today. And then go ahead and add one to that because I just made you make another decision. Are you gonna humor me in this little experiment or not? I guarantee that whatever number you just came up with in your head falls woefully short of reality. Researchers tell us, listen to this, 
that adults make upwards of 35,000 decisions per day. (laughs) That's roughly 2,000 decisions per waking hour or one decision every two seconds. Like in the last two seconds, you've decided whether you're gonna keep listening to me or not. They estimate, these researchers estimate that we make 226.7 decisions each day on food alone. Um, I've been all week racking my brain. I'm like, what is the 0.7? Is that like, I shouldn't be hungry, but I am hungry. It's late at night. I'm looking for a healthy snack. So I ended up crushing like one and a half Oreos. So it's like 0.7. Like, I don't really know where that comes from. Just in your waking hours today already, you've decided like how many times you're going to hit the snooze button. How many of y'all hit the snooze button this morning? Be honest, safe place. All right, I hit it a couple times this morning. Um, You decided whether you're going to have coffee or tea or some other drink or skip it all together. Um, If you're a female, you decided between one of the four outfits you likely tried on this morning. Um, If you're a dude, you did the sniff test to decide if you could get one more wear out of that shirt this week. Um, I would ask if any of you decided to skip a shower this morning, but if that's you, the last thing I want is for you to raise your hand. Um, Jesus loves you. Be washed in the blood and in your shower. Yes and amen. Um, You decided decided whether you're going to come to church. You decided what route you'd take to get here. You decided whether you would obey the parking guy or take the closer spot you could see ahead and just ignore him. You decided whether you're going to sit up front here with my boy Emmanuel in amen corner or in the back or in the aisle where you can kind of slip out early. And that is not even a fraction of the decisions you have had to make if kids are in the mix. Can I get a witness? Like this morning on Sunday, is it Sundays that the kid likes the blue plate? Because yesterday they liked the green plate. And are they going to throw a fit if they have the green plate? And is it on Sundays that they like the mini waffles? Or is that every other Thursday on only odd numbered days? Like, should I feed them at all today? Should I hug them? Should I yell at them? Should I punch them? Like, what? like don't, don't, don't report me. I'm just trying to figure it out. We are, right? On and on and on the decision making goes 35,000 times per day. And even though 95% of these decisions are made subconsciously, what I'm trying to get you to see is that every single day we are asking and answering tens of thousands of questions for ourselves. Should I read a book with this free time? Should I watch Netflix in this free time? Should I eat steak or chicken tonight? Should I wear athleisure like always? Or should I attempt to dress like an adult today? (laughs) And some decisions we have to consider are far more serious than kind of the lighthearted ones I'm giving you. Like, where should I go to school? What should I major in? Where should I invest? Is this the right relationship for me? Should I address that thing with that person? Should we move in my aging mother with us to live? This morning, I want to submit to you life's most important question to decide. I call it life's most important question because how you decide this question is going to impact all other questions. It's going to shape your identity, it's going to determine your purpose, and it's going to influence your actions every single day for the rest of your life. And here's the question. What will I do with Jesus? What will I do with Jesus? Now, if you're a believer in here, I I don't want you to check out because in one sense, if you're a believer, you've already decided what you're gonna do with Jesus, but I don't want you to check out because I wanna show you from John chapter seven what Jesus now wants to do with you. It's crucial to understanding your purpose as a follower of Christ. But for every single person under the sound of my voice this morning, the question is, what will I do with Jesus? And see, this is the exact question that the crowds are being forced to consider by the time that we arrive at John chapter seven. John chapter seven, here we find Jesus in Jerusalem teaching to a divided crowd. Some people in the crowd have become, uh, quite frankly, infatuated with him. They started following him while others, namely the religious crowd, have become infuriated with him. The religious crowd in this instance uh, is primarily made up of two groups of people, the the chief priests and the Pharisees. If you're new to church, these groups, the chief priests and the Pharisees, they're basically kind of think of them as like the board of directors for all things Jewish, for all things Old Testament. So when Jesus comes around equating himself with God through these I am statements, essentially saying I am God in the flesh, the religious group, they are outraged. And not only has he infuriated them with claims about himself, but now he's about to send them over the edge with some claims that he's about to make about them. So let's get some context for that. Look back at verses 28 and 29 in your Bible. Verse 28 says, so Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple. Essentially, Jesus is standing up in church in front of these religious people. And he says, you know me, you know where I come from, but I've not come of my own accord for he who sent me is true in him you do not know. I know him for I come from him and he sent me. I need you to think about this because Jesus stands in the temple 
and looks at the most religious, privileged, and well-taught people of the Jewish scriptures, and he says, the fact that you have rejected me and I came from God means you don't actually know God as father. And just in case he felt a little unclear, the next chapter, he's gonna double down on this and say, not only is God not your father, but you belong to your father, the devil. See, one of the things you need to know is that you cannot be confronted with Jesus and remain indifferent toward him. To reject Jesus or to even remain indifferent toward him is to reject God. And I know it's really popular today to say things like, well, I have my own relationship with God. You don't really understand it. But, but understand Jesus clearly here. And this statement is as offensive today as it was back then. To not have Jesus as your savior is to not have God as your heavenly father. As we saw a few weeks ago, Jesus is the only door. He's the only way. He's the only truth. He is the life. No one comes to God the Father except through Jesus. And so the question for you today is the same as it was to them. What will you do with Jesus? What emotions does Jesus provoke in you when you think about him? Is it love or is it resentment? Is it peace or is it confusion? Is it delight or is it some sense of Boredom. Can honestly tell you the one thing people never were with Jesus was bored, <laughs> which means that if you're bored with him, you've probably never encountered the real Jesus. And so that's the background leading up to verse 37. Let's look back at it. Verse 37, where we started, it says, On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. See, everything Jesus is about to say happens on the last day of this great feast. It's called the Feast of the Tabernacles or Feast of Booze, maybe your translation calls it. Um, Pastor JD talked about this feast in his I Am the Light of the World sermon because it was the backdrop for that thing as well. But let me kind of give you a quick refresher in case you weren't here. The Feast of Tabernacles was this seven-day feast where all the families of Israel would gather together in Jerusalem to celebrate and remember how God provided for them in the wilderness during their 40 years of wandering because of their disobedience and disbelief. And so for seven days, all the people of Israel would come together in Jerusalem during this feast and they would live in little tents or little booths. That's why it's called that kind of feast, to be reminded of God's faithfulness, how God protected them from the elements for 40 years. And one of the main parts of this seven-day feast, part of this seven-day ritual, was the part that involved water. See, every single morning, the priest would gather all the people of Israel at the temple, and then he would kind of lead them in this procession all the way to the pool of Siloam, which was about a half mile away. Once they got to that pool, the priest would take this golden pitcher, this giant golden goblet thing, and he would fill it up with water, and then he would lead that procession all the way back to the temple as all the people would sing what's called the Jewish Hallels. Jewish Hallels were these praise psalms uh, that you can find them today in Psalm 113 through 118. These psalms that consist of the Israelites thinking about all the ways that God has provided for them in in the midst, like in their midst, and they'd be singing these as they would walk back to the temple. They'd be singing things like trust in the Lord, give thanks to the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And so once the entire crew would get back to the temple, the priest would then take this golden container full of water. He would pour the water out onto the altar, which would then cause everybody's minds, it would kind of jog their minds to think in three directions. First, as the water's being poured out, it caused them to look back and be reminded how God provided and poured out water for them in the desert. That in the desert, in those 40 years of wandering, God led them by a pillar of cloud by day, by a pillar of fire by night. He provided manna to eat every single day. He provided streaming water from rocks in the desert to drink. God had instructed Moses to strike the rock and out of that rock would come flowing water for them to drink and sustain them. So it caused them to look back as this water is being poured out. Second, it would cause them to look at the present praising God for the year's provision of harvest and seeking his blessing for that coming year, believing that just as God provided for them back then, God's going to provide for Israel now. Lastly, this ritual wouldn't cause them just to look back and at the present. It would cause them to look forward in faith to the day that God would fulfill his ultimate promise that he made through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 44, when God said, for I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. So I'm gonna provide for you physically, but also I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. So he's gonna provide for them spiritually as well. So verse 37 says, it's on the last day of this feast, the great day, that Jesus stood up and cried out. So with that knowledge, let me just paint this picture for you. I need you to understand how important this is, how significant this moment is. 
that for six straight days, the people of Israel have been performing this ritual day after day after day after day after day after day. And so now it's the last day. It's the great day. And so picture it, it's day seven, it's early in the morning. Israel's gathered together from the morning sunrise. They're singing these Hallels, they're praising God. And for the final time, the priest returns with this golden pitcher. And as they all stand around watching him pour out the water, the people are recalling God's past, present and future faithfulness. And just as that pitcher runs dry, just as they are wondering on day seven, will the future prophecy of Isaiah ever come true? Just at that last drop of water, Jesus, Jesus stands up and cries out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. It's at this moment that Jesus is declaring, you've all now experienced the best and tasted the best that everything of religion and ritualism has to offer. Like what you're experiencing, this is as good as it gets. However, if this whole thing has left you wanting more, If this whole ritual hasn't satisfied your ultimate thirst, come to me and drink. And so it's in this short story that Jesus gives us three things to consider. He gives us a condition, an invitation, and a commission. So first, we're going to look at our condition. Our condition. It's right there, the end of verse 37. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And y'all, this is one of those things about Jesus's message that was just so dang offensive to the Pharisees. Because keep in mind, the Pharisees, ultimate religious group, these are the types of people who have spent their entire lives trying to become the type of person that God would bless. They've kept the commandments, they've memorized the Torah, they've performed all the rituals perfectly, yet Jesus stands before them and says, hey, if anyone thirsts, let them come to me and drink but there's one condition to coming. Do you see what it is? If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. The condition, Pharisees, isn't perfection, isn't religion, isn't ritualism. The condition is thirst. That's the only condition. And so what does Jesus mean by thirsting? Let me tell you, Jesus is not just suggesting here that we all, you know, every once in a while need a quick Sunday hit of praise and worship, you know, kind of take the edge off life. That's not what he's saying. Jesus is pointing out the reality that all of us have felt in one way or another. This thirst, that there's something inside of us that's constantly thirsty, that's constantly longing, that's constantly yearning for something. And maybe you haven't known what to call that or how to identify it, but there's something inside of you that's always thinking that there's gotta be something more. There's gotta be something better. There's gotta be more satisfying than just waking up and going to a job and collecting a paycheck and coming home and deciding what to eat for dinner and then watching Netflix and scrolling social media. Or maybe for you, it's kind of the other side of that, that there's something inside of you that just thinks you're never doing enough that you could always be doing more, that you could always be doing better, that success and happiness and peace, they're attainable, but they're right around the corner and they always seem to just be out of reach for you. There's a German word that psychologists use for this concept. It's called Sehnsucht. Sehnsucht. See, Sehnsucht represents thoughts and feelings about all facets of life that are unfinished or imperfect. Zinzuk is this inconsolable yearning or this wistful longing for something that you can't quite explain or don't even know yet. It reflects this search for happiness and meaning or this struggle to cope with losses and unrealizable wishes in life. It's your soul trying to grapple with a pervasive emptiness that lurks in corners of your heart that you're scared to actually explore lest you find something you don't like, yet at the same time, you have this paradoxical yearning for some inexplicable more in life. Or maybe for you, you're like, bro, that just went so far over my head. (laughs) You might resonate more with British psychoanalyst Anna Freud who said, if some longing goes unmet, we should not be astonished. That's just called life. So you might call it life. You might call it Zinzucht. Jesus calls it thirst. And as long as you are trying to satisfy that thirst with anything other than God, you are going to remain thirsty. I don't know about you, but my life has been marked with being thirsty. I've been thirsty for love, thirsty for meaning, thirsty for approval, thirsty for purpose, 
Before Christ, I tried to satisfy this thirst with the next girlfriend or the next high or the next party or the next car or the next accolade. And maybe they would make that go away for a moment, but then it always left me asking, what now? Like, what's next? There's gotta be something more. The great Tim Keller, I'm kind of paraphrasing him here. Look at what he said. He said, most of us tell ourselves that the reason we remain unfulfilled is because we simply haven't been able to achieve our goals. So you experience your inner emptiness as drive and your anxiety as hope, all the while remaining completely oblivious to how deep your spiritual thirst actually is. So much of what we label in America as good things, things like drive or hope or ambition, and certainly those can be good, they have their rightful place, but so often, Keller points out, we use those things to mask our much deeper issue of spiritual thirst. This is the type of thirst that the Samaritan woman had in the well at the well in John chapter four. The the famous Samaritan woman who didn't realize the depth of her spiritual thirst. So she was constantly going to the well of relationships, trying to fill that lonely void with men. And so instead she just ended up jumping from relationship to relationship only for each of those relationships to end in disappointment and a continued thirst for someone to love. But then along comes Jesus, the son of God, and he meets her at this well in the sweltering heat of midday. And he says to her, John chapter four, verse 14, he says, whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him is gonna become in him a spring of living water welling up to eternal life. Jesus meets this woman and says, hey, what you need is not physical water from this well to satisfy your thirst. You don't need to keep coming back to the well of relationships to try to satisfy your thirst. What you need is the spiritual water that only I can give. See, some of you, just like the woman at the well, you've been thirsty for relationships out of a desire to be loved. That desire to be loved, I wanna tell you, that is a natural desire, but it is a misplaced desire if you're trying to satisfy that thirst in another human being. Or maybe for you, you've been thirsty for sexual fulfillment to try to fill that desire to be wanted. And so you jump from partner to partner and app to app, maybe to be satisfied for a night, but then you're back to being thirsty again, back to swiping, back to searching. Some of you have been thirsty for recognition, thinking that a title or a paycheck is gonna make you feel accomplished or affirmed of or some form of affirmation, yet you just keep climbing the ladder only to realize that there's always another rung with someone who has more money, more power, more influence, and more accomplishments than you. You drink for a moment, that bonus might taste good, but then you are thirsty again. Makes me think of Rain Wilson. It's kind of random, but you know, every favorite, everybody's favorite idiot, Dwight Schrute, right? You can find this. He, he said this in multiple interviews since the office had ended. He says this. He says, when I was on the office, I spent several years really mostly unhappy because, well, it wasn't ever enough. He said, here I was on the greatest job I could ever imagine, on the greatest TV show of all time, getting paid millions of dollars, playing one of the most memorable characters, getting nominated for several awards, part of this beautiful family of actors and writers, yet all I could think about was, why am I not the next movie star? He said, why? all I could think about was, why am I not like the next Jack Black or next Will Ferrell? Why don't I have the new development deal? And I quote, he said, no matter how much I got, it was never enough. Contrary to Dwight Schrute's belief, apparently perfectenschlag is not actually attainable through earthly circumstances, okay? <laughs> Only office fans will get that. It was never enough. Church, this is what thirst feels like. And here's the thing, God actually explains why we keep feeling this thirst. In Jeremiah chapter two, verse 13, God says, for my people have committed a double evil, two things. First, they've abandoned me, the fountain of living water. And then second, they've dug cisterns for themselves, crack cisterns that cannot hold water. And so let's not forget our context. In John chapter seven, Jesus is not talking to a group of rebellious people. He's talking to a group of religious people. And it's one of the things that makes the story most surprising. The fact that religious people, according to Jesus, can be the thirstiest people of all. Because religious people, Summit family, don't know, like we know how to avoid the secular cisterns, right? We know how to avoid the cisterns of immorality and debauchery and promiscuity. But we have this problem. We still have a tendency to go back to our cracked man-made cisterns of performance and pride and arrogance and self-righteousness. And what happens is Jesus comes along and turns that works-based righteousness on its head. And Jesus says, don't you dare forget that it's only the sick that need a doctor. 
It's only the hungry who are going to receive the bread of life. It's only the lost who are going to be found. It's only the dead who are going to be given life. It's only the blind who are going to see. It's only the thirsty who are going to actually come to me for living water that can satisfy your soul. Because see, the same gospel that the rebellious need is the same gospel that the religious need. Because without Christ, we all have the same spiritual condition. We are thirsty. And see, that's the first thing Jesus wants us to consider. Our condition. But Jesus doesn't just leave us there with the bad news, right? The gospel is good news. Welcome to church. So Jesus gives us good news. He then gives us an invitation. That's our second thing. Jesus' invitation. If anyone thirsts, what does he say? Let him come to me and drink. And y'all, I ain't, I ain't trying to get fancy on this one at all. It's as simple as it gets. If you find yourself thirsty, come to Jesus. And let's be good Bible readers. Notice what he does not say. He doesn't say, if you're thirsting after something, I want you to come and sign this statement. I want you to come memorize these verses, memorize these creeds, know how to recite this thing, raise your hands at the exact right moment in worship, go through these classes, perform these rituals. No, he simply says, come and have a personal relationship with me. And let me tell you, I know how this can sound because I've sat in your seat before. I know that this can sound like some super spiritual, ethereal, let go and let God, you know, kind of thing. Like just give your life to Jesus and all your hopes and dreams and desires will be filled and realized. And I, I tell you that again, because I've sat in your seat. I, I've been in your seat where the guy stands up on stage and tells me everything that he apparently knows about my life. And I sit there thinking, so if I just give my life to Jesus, all my problems are gonna go away. Let me tell you, that's not what Jesus is saying. And that's not what I'm saying. But if what Jesus is inviting us to is true, then that has unending eternal benefits for your life. See, if coming to Jesus means a personal relationship with him, then it means that when you come to Jesus, you have absolute assurance that he's going to accept you and keep you no matter what guilt or regrets or baggage or sins or scars or shame that you bring because he's the one who invited you in the first place. You didn't earn your invitation. If coming to Jesus means a personal relationship with him, it means that God's love and approval of you is not dependent on how well you have performed spiritually this week. It's like we often say around here, there's nothing I've done that can make God love me any less and there's nothing I could do that can make him love me any more. It means that even during the hardest and driest times of your life, you will be, like Psalm chapter one says, like a tree planted by streams of living water, which will yield its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither, and that everything you do will prosper. It means that even when the world lets you down, when the boss doesn't recognize you, when your kids think you're some kind of evil witch out to destroy them, when your friend betrays you, when your body fails you, that your identity and your self-worth are no longer dependent on other people's opinions of you or your external circumstances. If coming to Jesus means a personal relationship with him, you can be confident that regardless of your circumstances, that you are loved by God, you have been chosen by God, you have been forgiven by God, you have been redeemed by God, you have been adopted by God, and that no matter where you stand today, you are cherished and honored and loved and you are eternally part of the family of God. That's what it means to come to Jesus. And y'all, let me just throw a little personal testimony on this. I can honestly say that after following Jesus for 15 years, there ain't nobody like him. To know that every single day I wake up that God loves me, that God approves of me, that he actually wants to be around me, that God actually likes me, to know that I don't have to perform in, in, for him is so good for my soul. To know that every day my identity and security and satisfaction are not on the line. Y'all, that is so freeing. Because when you find your fulfillment in him, listen, it allows you to freely enjoy other things in life. Things like friendships and relationships and work and fun without needing those things to supply the fulfillment for you because you've already found the fulfillment in Jesus. So that's the freedom and joy you get by coming to Jesus. But you can't just come to Jesus. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. True story, 100% true. You can go look this up later. In 1999, there was, I'm laughing, thinking about this, sorry. There was a four-year-old girl in Wales who all of a sudden turned this like super bright orange and yellowy color. 
Um, her parents, as good parents should, you know, they couldn't figure this thing out. Their kid was acting pretty normal, not showing any signs of illness. Um, and they lived in Wales where, you know, it's basically just like cold, gray and wet year round. So it couldn't be like a sunburn. And so um, like any good parent should, they ended up taking their kid to local hospital. And what Dr. Duncan Cameron of Glanclid Hospital, lest you think I'm making this up, figured out was that this little girl's condition was caused by a massive intake of beta carotene. Now, for you non-scientists, beta carotene was an additive found mainly in one popular kid's drink at the time to help boost its orange color. 1999, orange kid's drink. Who, who can guess what it is? Anybody? Somebody said Tang on Thursday night. I was like, no, it's not Tang. Like, yeah, right next to Surge. Um, like, no, it's um, Sunny Delight. Y'all remember Sunny D? Man, just crushing this stuff. L listen to this. They, they figured out that this four-year-old kid was drinking so much Sunny D that she literally began to turn orange and yellow. This, after, like, after like interviewing her parents, they realized that this four-year-old girl was drinking an average of one and a half liters of Sunny D per day. Like, as, as a parent, I can't even fathom that. It's like, my parents come to me, they're like, dad, I'm like, shut up, go drink your Sunny D. Like, what, like how does that even happen? <laughs> Here, why do I tell you that ridiculous story? Here's my point and why I tell you that. That little girl, listen, started to become like what she was drinking. Listen, the same is true of you and me spiritually. We become like what we drink. That means if you are constantly drinking in a love of praise from others, a love of money, a love of pleasure, a love of success, a love of affirmation, it's gonna change you spiritually because you're gonna remain thirsty when you don't receive those things. If you're drinking in the belief that you have to earn your way to God, that you have to do enough religious things, you have to perform in order to get God's love and approval, it's gonna change you spiritually. You're never gonna have assurance on where you truly stand with God. It's gonna leave you uneasy and spiritually anxious. Oh, but church, if you drink deeply of the gospel, you'll see that no one is too bad to be lost and no one is too good to be saved. You're gonna thirst after his grace and mercy, which according to Psalm 23 is going to follow you all the days of your lives. And so you can drink from that well anytime you want. If you're drinking from the gospel, then the living water that now flows in you because the Holy Spirit lives in you, the spirit which produces love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control, that's what you're gonna become. You're gonna become more loving. You're gonna become more peaceful. You're gonna become more patient because you become like what you drink. And so the obvious question is, well, how do I drink? That sounds great. But how do I drink? What does that even mean? It's simple. We drink by faith. Think about it like this. If you're dying of thirst in a desert and all you have is a rope and a bucket, that's not going to do you much good, right? But if there's a well nearby filled with water, you do need the rope and the bucket to get the water out. See, faith is the bucket by which you have the ability to draw water out of the well of salvation and drink to satisfy your heart's deepest longing. That's how simple Jesus's invitation is. Come and drink. And y'all, drinking's easy. It's so easy that both babies and fools can do it. Infants and idiots can both drink, right? It doesn't take a college degree. It doesn't take a list of accomplishments to drink. Every person from the least person on the face of this earth to the greatest person can drink because they've all experienced thirst. And that's all it takes to be satisfied by Jesus is thirst and the ability to drink. Here's the sad part though. I've seen this for over a decade as, the pastor, as a pastor. Many people stop right there. Like they come and drink and that's great, that's awesome, but then that's it. And here's why I say that's sad because here's what I know about water. The best lakes are those that have both an inflow and an outflow, right? Lakes that are all inflow, they tend to grow stagnant. The classic example of this is the Dead Sea, which is actually a lake. In the Dead Sea, the Dead Sea is so salty that it's impossible for any living thing to survive. There's no fish, there's no plants, there's no microorganisms, nothing. But the main factor that contributes to that reality in the Dead Sea, I mean, of course it is that there's all this salt, but the main factor that contributes to that is that there are not any outlets. See, a ton of water flows into the Dead Sea from the Jordan River, but nothing flows out. The Dead Sea is input with no output. Summit, God has not called us to be Dead Sea Christians. Christians that are all input with no output. 
Christians that attend church and listen to podcasts and read the books and gather in our safe little holy huddles, input, 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 but not actually doing anything to expand the kingdom, not actually serving anyone, not actually pursuing justice, not actually loving our neighbor, not actually sharing the gospel with others. We are not called to be so spiritually minded that we are no earthly good. That's why Jesus said in verse 38, if we keep reading, he said, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And to be clear, Jesus isn't saying, hey, the more work you do for me to satisfy me, the more you live on mission, that's who God's pleased with. No, he's saying it's working from the satisfaction we found in Jesus because of the Holy Spirit that lives within us that now we live on mission because we can't wait to share the same living water we have received with everybody else. The Christian life is not do, 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 but come, drink, be filled, and let the Holy Spirit do through you. And that's our third and final consideration from Jesus. We've got a condition, we've got an invitation, but then you and I have the Spirit's commission. We have a new mission set upon our lives. See, we're not just saved to be satisfied. It's not less than that. It's so much more than that. We're not saved just to be personally satisfied. We are saved to live sent for him. We say it around here all the time. That's why we end our services by saying, you are sent. You are sent is not some like, you know, Christianese way of us saying like, get out of here. (laughs) Like, no, it's saying that, hey, wherever God has placed you, he has filled you with the Holy Spirit. He's called you to a commission, to a mission to go live this thing out, to share the same living water that hopefully you have received and come and drink from. We're saying that God didn't just save you to come sit in here on Sunday. He saved you to go live sent Monday through Saturday. And so verse 38, whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his heart, Literally in Greek, that means out of his belly, out of his innermost being where the Holy Spirit resides will flow rivers, not a river, not singular, plural, rivers of living water. Verse 39, now this Jesus said about the Spirit, the Holy Spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive for as yet the Spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now at this point, 2024, Jesus has been glorified. It's what we celebrated last weekend on Easter. Therefore, now when you and I come and drink, the Holy Spirit is poured into our lives just as was prophesied all the way back in Joel chapter two and then fulfilled in Acts chapter two at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon believers. But as believers, when we come, drink by faith, we're filled with the Spirit. We are not to bottle up that Spirit and keep him for ourselves. We're not to be Dead Sea Christians. We're not just recipients of Grace Summit family. We are now channels of it. We're not just receivers of grace. We are rivers of grace. And you need to know this commission is not reserved for some kind of super saint. I don't know where we got that idea in evangelicalism that, hey, the the rivers of grace, the channels of God's goodness, that's kind of reserved for, you know, those with speaking gifts or outgoing personalities or apologetic intellectualism. No, if the spirit is inside of you, then you have rivers, plural, of living water flowing in and through you. God has a commission on your life. In fact, scripture says you are now a minister of reconciliation. You are an ambassador for Christ. An ambassador represents that he came to represent. You are an ambassador for Jesus that God actually makes his gospel appeal to see others saved. The gospel, which is the power and the salvation for all who would believe that God likes to make that gospel appeal through you. Do you understand that? That this idea of coming, drinking, become rivers of living water, this is a life-changing, perspective-altering, eternity-securing, thirst-quenching living water that's now in us that should flow through us into the lives of others. What an invitation, what a commission to not only have your own soul totally satisfied forever, but also to know that your life now impacts eternity for others as you offer them the same living water that was offered to you. We have our condition, Jesus' invitation, and the Spirit's commission. And you know what I love about my Bible is that the same Jesus that shows up in John chapter 7 is the same Jesus that was prophesied about all the way back in Genesis and Isaiah, throughout the entire Old Testament, all this religion, all this ritualism. It wasn't to earn their way to God, it was to point to him. And see, 600 years before Jesus would give this invitation to come and drink, the prophet Ezekiel actually saw a day, he had a vision when a mighty river would actually flow out of that temple in Jerusalem. 
And that river, as it would flow out of the temple in Jerusalem, would get deeper and deeper and deeper. And as it went, it would bring life and health and growth and flourishing and abundance to all the dry and barren places it would reach. In this vision, that river that began in the temple would finally empty into, surprise, surprise, the Dead Sea. Because see, to Ezekiel, the Dead Sea represented the nations who didn't have the hope of the Messiah. But now we have Jesus standing in that temple, ground zero for that future prophetic river that is to come on the last day of this Feast of Booze, declaring, don't you see it? I'm Ezekiel's river that brings life and flourishing and abundance to the ends of the earth through the fulfillment of the gospel message. There's Jesus standing saying, I'm the living water that your soul has been longing for. Jesus standing saying, in this physical temple where I stand from this moment on, the temple's gonna be not here, it's gonna be in your hearts and my spirit is gonna dwell in you. That just as God protected Israel in their tents and their booths in the wilderness for 40 years, Jesus says, I am the tent that covers your shame and protects you from the penalty of your sin. That just as Moses struck the rock in the desert to pour forth water to drink, Jesus says, I am the rock that is going to be struck to pour out the Holy Spirit who now gives you eternal life. He says, I am the one who's gonna drink the cup of God's wrath on your behalf so that you can drink from the well of salvation. And just a few weeks after that declaration, Jesus would march up to Calvary hang from a cross and declare, I thirst. See, on the cross, Jesus would experience cosmic thirst, so now you and I can experience satisfaction for our spiritual thirst. And just like the priest pouring out the water on the Feast of Tabernacles, the blood of Jesus would be poured out on the cross as God's way of saying, I provided not just for your body, but I've provided for your soul. So what are you gonna do with Jesus? Whether you're rebellious or religious, the invitation is open. Come and drink and you can go from longing to truly living. You can go from performing to actually enjoying life. You can go from being consumed by other people's opinions to being consumed by the love of God. You can actually go from being needy to meeting other people's needs. Instead of striving and thirsting, you can rest and be satisfied. I heard the voice of Jesus say, behold, I freely give. The living water, thirsty ones, stoop down and drink and live. I came to Jesus and I drank of that life-giving stream. My thirst was quenched, my soul revived, and now I live in him. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this open invitation to come and drink and be satisfied. This morning, would you give eyes of faith to take the next step in whatever you're calling them? God, we pray we ask in Jesus' name, amen.